You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market updates and trading strategies. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com and co-hosts Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionPit.com. All right, everybody, that rocking tune means it is time yet again for the Option Block, everyone's favorite bi-weekly source of all things options related, a little bit of education, a little bit of wit, a little bit of wisdom, a little bit of unusual activity, some analysis, some strategery, throw in some listener questions, and you've got the heady brew that is the Option Block. My name is Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com as well as from little thing we like to call around these hair parts, the old Options Insider Radio Network. No shortage of great content on that network for you guys to choose from. You can find it pretty much anywhere you like to find audio audio files, including iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, of course, our website, theoptionsinsider.com. Uh, working on getting it up there. See, you can do it on SoundCloud now as well, so we're going to get you up there on SoundCloud. So if you're a SoundCloud user and you perhaps want to rotate some podcast listening in with your music listening. We'll see if we can help you out with that. And of course, our mobile app available for iOS, Android, and the Fire OS. No shortage of ways for you guys to get your hands on all of this option block goodness, as well as, of course, everything else we do here on the old network, our daily options news show, our daily unusual activity show, uh, all sorts of stuff, our education programs, our volatility weekly program, our show for financial advisors, you name it, we've got it on there, and you guys can check it out. And joining me on the old program today are my two option block all-star panel compatriots, Starting off with the man beaming in from the great state of Maine, fresh off some hot options, oddities, action, and ready to talk some more options goodness. He is the rock lobster himself, Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi, from, of course, the aforementioned options oddity, as well as from a little thing they like to call the old option pit. Mr. Rock Lobster, welcome back to the old program, sir. It is good to be back. I feel like I was just here. I don't know. Was it Friday? Was it Thursday? <laughs> By the way, our Vol Views segment with the Vol getting crushed. Oh, my gosh. We can talk about that later. What yes. a crush. Well, that was quite the crush. More crushing to come. More crushing to be discussed forthwith. But before we discuss all that crushing goodness, let me also introduce he of Uncle Mike Tussaud fame. Yes, Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM Wealth Advisors. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the program, sir. How are things in scenic and sunny St. Charles? Oh, every day is a holiday, every meal is a feast, just as it always is. Good stuff, and another good day in the market, so the diehard bull and you must be happy. Always happy. <laughs> All right, without further ado, let's get to that bullish activity and that ball crush. Yes, it's time for the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for the trading block. All right, everybody, welcome to the trading block. Like the name implies, this is the portion of the program where we break down what's moving, what's shaking, what's cooking out there in the old market. We are recording this on Monday, July 13th for all of you playing the home game. And as Andrew alluded to at the top of the show, it's kind of ball crush palooza around here. If you tuned into our Ball View show this morning, you know we were talking about it uh, last Friday as well, getting into the, the Vol crush we saw at the end of last week. Of course, there dropping down from the brief flirtation the VIX Cash had with the 20 handle. I think it hit about 20.05, so just ever so slightly 
crossing into the 20 handle before uh, retreating back aggressively, uh, dropping off substantially on Friday to about in the 16 handle range again. And we're selling off again today for all of you out there loving percents of percents, uh, over 16 percent out there in Bix Cash land, about 2.8 handles. Hovering right around the 14 even handle out there in VIX cash land as all things Greece seem to be perhaps in the rear view mirror. We'll see for sure that that one seems to have a, a pesky habit of popping its head up when you least expect it. We've said it a few times before that it seems to be uh, done and it has can, kept popping its head up. But it seems at least for now that the Greek tasty gyro situation is in the background. Uh, the market's responding accordingly. S&P up 1.1%. The Dow up 1.3%. NASDAQ up 1.8% uh, on the day here. So just rally ho mode wherever you look. Pick a strike, pick a handle, pick a name. Uh, chances are it was green on the board today. So let's start there. Mr. Rock Lobster, we'll start with you. A sea of green, unless you're looking from a vol perspective, then it was just a sea of volatility death you and I prognosticated at the end of the Vol View show uh, that maybe we would see about like a 13 to 14 handle this week. And I kind of jokingly referred to maybe we'd, we'd flirt with the nine handle only half jokingly. And it seems like that <laughs> may even be less of a joke now, given the just Vol apocalypse we saw today. It it was so ugly and so painful. Um, I, I there's <laughs> it's not much to say. Uh, for all those people in vol trading land, um, you know, they, the thing is, what's funny is the, the Greek parliament still has to vote. I mean, I, I guess they could say no. And then there's no more room left from the EU. I guess this is kind of like, okay, guys, we, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think they're actually getting a worse deal than they would have got if they just would have negotiated <laughs> in good faith. But I, I don't know. So. There is, I would say, a hair of uncertainty, but um, as far as vol volatility can only far so far, far so far so fast, and I think it today it probably fell, you know, as much as it could fall. Uh, you know, at the money volatility is down like two or three points. I mean, that's a huge, huge number. And they're everybody like, oh, and then in China, since it's illegal to open a short position now, and they'll take you out and shoot you or put you in jail. The Chinese market has stopped going down, so at least the longs aren't bailing out either. And I think that's uh, – I don't know how long that's going to last, um, but I actually think the, the volatility now in China is fair, even though it's a little higher. Um, so I I think there's some opportunity there. I just – I don't see how that's over yet. You know, market drops 25 percent and then miraculously stops, although I do not – I do not doubt the ability of the Chinese government to – control the uh financial markets there at least for right now at some point they won't be able to but right now they still they still drive a pretty big hammer <laughs> yeah it's got to break at some point right at some point either you know the sellers have to come back in the the government has to blink or it's pretty much uh, pitchforks and torches in the streets that's pretty much the only alternative right <laughs> so there's you can only you can only forcibly make the market go up at gunpoint for so long hey, it is kind you think about it like if you short a stock, I mean, you were uh, in the U.S. It was illegal to short stocks. I guess they'd throw you in jail, right? Uh, or mostly just your systems. You know, they they click a button and it just doesn't allow you to hit the short button anymore. Hey, wait, wait a minute, this short selling thing doesn't work anymore. Uh, in China, if they catch you, you know, they they will they'll, they'll do worse things to you, I guess. So I don't know how long that will last. And you know, it was a very expensive stock market uh, to begin with. And we'll, and we'll see. I mean, obviously, there's tremendous opportunity still there, but it was getting pretty pretty ahead of itself. So <laughs> we ignored it till last week. Yes, yes. So the China, there's been China bears floating around, but they've been there forever. So people kind of just take them, you know, in passing. And now it seems like all their all their dire predictions are starting to prove a little bit more prescient than a lot of people thought. Uncle Mike, we turn now our attention to you. What caught your eye in today's uh, Myriad of upside activity, unless, of course, you're talking vol, then it was downside palooza. Well, in terms of forcing a market up at gunpoint, you can only do it for so long. That's what they said about borrowing money in the U.S. Come on now. Um, with that, I mean, Greece gets a deal. It looks like things will go well in Iran. Market's up. I'm curious to see if this will last tomorrow. Uh, I think that... Uh, 
I am still the eternal bull, uh, but uh, I don't know if I'd necessarily be jumping in with both feet today quite yet. Would like to see a little bit of follow up tomorrow. I, I was looking for I'm it's one of these things where it's, I feel like, OK, all the good news is out. I mean, how much better can the news get? So I'm I was trying to look for some kind of like short, slightly short delta kind of short gamut type positions today just a little bit um and i was too chicken to pull the trigger on it um i was busy enough on winding other things so i just um we'll see i just i'd like to see some more new good news i kind of feel like the market is a lot like apple right now where you know apple needs a new product right now it's probably the best utility on the planet to own um, as far as dividends and things like that, but they need new, they need a new product to really get that kick to grow and get the stock price higher. It's like the U S I mean, we need some more, the feds no longer going to pump and the EU will plot along and maybe something that go happen in China, but it, the years of 10 to 12% growth there feel like are over just because the economy is so big. But so what, what, what makes us propels us higher, you know? And I feel like that's where kind of we keep hitting this 2100 level and kind of stopping. And that's, I feel like, sort of where we are again. Just getting up to that level, but we don't have really a good reason to go higher because we're already trading at a pretty, I'm not, not an insane premium, but a, a healthy premium overall. So I don't know if that's enough to get us, you know, going. You know, speaking of, you invoked the, uh, the Apple. So, of course, that means we can get into discussion of other uh, frothy, silly, retail-heavy, uh, crazy uh, names. And they don't get much more frothy these days than the old Widowmaker itself, Netflix. Widowmaker to the upside these days, not so much to the downside. Uh, market just loving what they're seeing out there ahead of this split. Uh, going, uh, let's see, just up about 4% on the day or about 27 handles closing just to here under $708. So uh, pre-split. Rally ho mode, uh, lighten it up from an options perspective as well, doing about 110,000 contracts today. That's about, oh, about 10% or so above the, uh, above what you typically see. And not surprisingly, perhaps, or maybe a little bit surprising, depending on your perspective, uh, that it's relatively even, Mr. Rock Lobster, between calls and puts, usually on a day like today. Such one sided movement in the underlying. You would probably see a bias. Toward the calls, but not really seeing that at all. About 56,000 on the call side, 53,000 on the put side. Even the net delta is relatively flat. So people getting in and uh, trying to uh, spec and position adjust perhaps ahead of this big, uh, big action here coming up in Netflix. Mr. Rock Lobster, I'd imagine your chat room today had a few things to say about the old flicks. What was going on out there in the pit chat when you're talking about the Widowmaker? Um. <laughs> We've we we had some interesting positions in there, uh, like owning some flies a couple of weeks ago to crab the upside, you know, positions. Just talking about them, uh, we're waiting for the split because we don't we don't want to deal with the the kind of the illiquid strikes afterward. But I don't know. I think after it splits, it's going to fly higher. It's just me, because it's it's already kind of crazyville, and then it's going to be what are they splitting ten for one? So it's gonna be even crazier, Bill. It's only it's only seventy dollars. Woohoo! <laughs> so who knows what's gonna happen? But I think it goes higher. It's I doing think. it's doing the Apple old. They're they're really just doing the Apple playbook. Seven for one split, uh, right around seven hundred. Yeah. So uh, yeah, doing the Apple playbook. It worked well for Apple. Apple certainly showed that you could rally pretty hard, thirty odd percent off the heels of a split. Hey, it's cheap now, right? Uh, so uh, you got to own it now. You didn't like it at 700. At 70, I can handle some cheers. Uh, so <laughs> exactly. I'm gonna, I'm There's gonna, less downside. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to put that into. Speaking of which, I was talking to some uh, some market makers this weekend, and they were just lamenting kind of the uh, the, the slow death of Apple from a uh, from a quality dispersion and just market making and trading perspective. How uh, not only did the vol kind of come off, obviously post split, which you kind of expect, uh, but also just you know those just getting as much Vega as you used to out there uh, from a notional, from a pure contract basis, it's become quite expensive. Uh, you know, those exchange fees don't go away just because it splits seven for one. Uh, you got to put on a few more contracts usually to get that same type of notional exposure you used to get. And so uh, the costs of trading out there have gone up uh, quite a bit 
and it's made Apple certainly a far less uh, desirable trade from a pro you know, dispersion market making slash volatility perspective, which is funny because, you know, uh, about a year ago or so, you talked to any of those guys who were still uh, slinging pretty much decent size out there in the equities and Apple was the only game to play. And uh, these days, not so much starting to look farther afield. It used to be Netflix. This one, I'm guessing, going to go away starting tomorrow. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, getting farther afield and harder to find some good quality candidates out there in the old uh, equity world, at least from a a market making and uh, you know vol trading perspective, but I'm sure we'll uncover a few more as we move on here into the old into the old earnings season. Of course, Fitbit rallying hard as well, hitting into the mid 40s. So all you guys who were writing in a couple of weeks ago asking if it was safe or smart to write some puts in the 20 handles, the little 30 handles. Well, uh, if you did, you're looking pretty genius in the rearview mirror here, as all those puts are. Well out of the money these days, and some of you, the ones even we mocked about legging into bullish risk reversals, you guys are looking pretty pretty good as well. So, uh, yeah, Fitbit, a crazy one. A very, very crowded, very, very contested market there, the fitness wearables. And, yeah, Fitbit clearly carving out some share, at least when it comes to the streets viewpoint. And speaking of what we're seeing on the street, it's that time of the show, listeners. It's time for us to dive on, dive on into... The seedier side of the business is time to dive on into the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for the odd block. everybody that funky tune means it's time once again for the odd block the portion of the show we break down weird wild sometimes just crazy head scratching paper that we're seeing in some names and we got a good one for you here to kick things off we're known here on the old the old odd block uh, to sometimes profile some head scratchers some interesting some compelling some strange, <laughs> some sometimes downright, what are they thinking type trades. And we're often known to do that in some, shall we say, thriftier names, a little bit lower priced names. And we got all of that for you to kick things off here on the odd block. Our first victim, good old I am Gold Corp. I just love that. I love that name. Uh, ticker symbol IAG. In the case you were, we were talking about Netflix before, $700. That was a little bit too rich for your blood. Maybe Fitbit hitting into the $45 range, a little bit too pricey for you. We got you covered. IAG closing today at whopping $1.86. So you can get all the IAG you wanted. And someone certainly did, at least speaking from a put perspective. This is the name that does about 4,000 contracts a day, doing 100,000 today. 217 and a half to one puts over calls that will tell you where the action was today. And if you guys just pull up your screens as you're following along playing the home game, scroll on out to the Dece one strike, you will see it for yourself. Uh, no open interest to speak of. These things are no bit at a dime. And someone came in and said, you're at a dime, huh? I'll take a few of those. In fact, I will take them all to the tune of buying 100,000 December $1, yes, $1 puts for a dime. Uh, so and they're still offered at a dime listeners so if you want more of these there are some to be had i'm guessing you can get perhaps quite a few of these off for a dime uh 100,000 yes went up in one block no no messing around no uh no no lollygagging here this one just went up straight size one block over there on the arca had a bit of a price variation to it but no stock that we saw so this was straight up as it seems, straight up, just uh, just the puts. We'll we'll keep an eye out for stock. Maybe maybe it showed up later. But as we as of the time of when we wrote this up, there was no stock to speak of. And so this our friend here, really really putting a lot out there to say, you know what? I think there's some pretty dark days ahead for I am gold and coming before the end of the year. And I'm willing to pay ten uh, percent of the potential profit of this trade and uh, about 5%, a little more than that, of the actual value of the stock uh, to put this spec on 
before the end of the year. Looking at a chart here of good old IAG. Uh, he's definitely uh, he's definitely pushing it to the extreme. This name has had some rough times. I don't believe it's ever cracked. Yeah, it looks like his lowest it's got is about a buck forty or so. So yeah, he needs this thing to break through the all time lows and beyond, well south of the one handle for this sucker to make any <laughs> any money. <laughs> yes, Andrew, I I agree with you as well. I, I I do wish I was a broker on that one, and I also wish that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> some some of the market makers may be not too, not too upset about that trade either. Of course, we'll see if this thing goes to zero before the end of the year. It may be a different story. But for now, at least, I'm sure more than a few of them happy to partake or depart with a few uh, dime puts out here in uh, I Am Gold. Mr. Rock Lobster, what's your take here? 100,000 crazy teeny puts going up here in I Am Gold. Was this you, sir? <laughs> That's exactly the kind of thing I want to put into the kids' college fund. A thousand of these... <laughs> <laughs> and a hundred thousand of these books. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with gold and all the gold stocks. Uh, I guess they just are over leveraged and they're never going to make any money because it is all ugly in gold land. I, I, even buying these puts, what are you going to get? I guess you can buy puts in stock with them and maybe make something. <laughs> You got a cool. Or somebody just wanted an excuse to buy stock. I guess you got a, you got a cool million bucks burning a hole in your pocket, and you want you want a good way to uh, throw it away. This might be one way. Um, that would do it. <laughs> so, I I I didn't see a big buy. I didn't see you know like I'm looking for five million, eight million, seven million shares, something. But I mean the the whole volume on the day was only six or seven million shares. So. I mean, if somebody bought it on a ratio, it was well hidden. So uh, it's just a head scratcher. It, you know what? It's just an oddity. It is an options oddity. That's why we do this show. That's why we do this segment to profile weird ones. Listeners, write in. What's a scenario you'd really want to dive in and buy uh, a dime put? Maybe not a hundred thousand times, but even a hundred times on a one dollar st- on a dollar eighty six stock. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's a, that's a bit of a head scratcher out there. We'll leave you guys to, to weigh in with your thoughts as we move on to our next celebutant victim, whatever you want to call him here on the old show. This is the, another old friend of ours here on the odd block marathon petroleum. Haven't checked in with them in a little while. Uh, ticker symbol MPC closing today about 58 and the orders are so up uh, nearly 8% or about $4 and 30 cents. So a good day. From an underlying perspective out here in good old Marathon Petroleum Corp land, also a decent day from an options volume perspective. This name averages about 4,000 contracts a day, doing nearly 20,000 today. And what caught our eye was a little bit uh, a little bit meteor strike than our previous name. We're going a little bit beyond a dollar, all the way up to $65. In this case, it was the Ock 65s going up. When we first started profiling them on a big sweep uh, across the exchanges, the first block went up on the Philly, a four, a buck fifty-five. Paper buying them one thousand times. Uh, as the day went on, more volume piled into the tune of twenty-two hundred total on that strike. Uh, I'm hoping the latter kind was for some better prices because he's wearing it on that first print. He paid a buck fifty-five for those. These things, even though the stock was up. Uh, it was up four handles. These things went out a buck oh five at a buck twenty five. So you can see how we caution you sometimes, listeners, in your irrational exuberance for upside calls. Uh, how that can get pricey very quickly. Uh, if you get a little bit too irrationally exuberant, uh, in this case, the sixty five handle was that bridge too far. Uh, then you're going to pay for it. And this our friend. He's already off a charitably thirty cents on these, and probably more closer to forty odd, maybe fifty cents on these. So these one, that first print's leaving a mark. Uh, I'm hoping the latter thousand or so had some better prices on there, and he could average into a little bit better price. Either way, it's all opening. Forty two contracts open on this strike, so this is all open in paper. Uh, someone's diving in with some aggressive love here for good old marathon looking at a chart here over the past year we'll we'll expand our search horizons to two years and still that's a pretty that's a record level for marathon they've never really flirted anywhere near the 65 handle in recent memory so our friend here overpaying for a strike that is uh, quite optimistic to be 
to be euphemistic. So uh, we'll see how our friend does. But so far, at least this one, if I had to, if I had the good, bad or ugly list right now, Mr. Rock Lobster, I would definitely lump this into the ugly side of the fence. Where do you fall on our friend here? Getting a little bit irrationally exuberant here in MPC. Yeah. I mean, cause NBC had that big rally today and I think that that customer just bought the top. I mean, sometimes you buy the top and they bought the top. <laughs> this guy literally, I think did. I'm looking at the, yeah, the high of the stock, it got about a, about nearly about a buck 50 higher up to 60, 30 or so. So yeah, you're right. He probably did buy almost the exact literal top there. <laughs> so, That's painful. It's not good. Um, and, you know, if it gets taken, uh, there was a lot of movement in some of the, you know, oils looking weaker, but all of a sudden these big diversified oil companies are looking better. I, I, I'm, I don't know. I couldn't, I didn't look enough at like the commodities and oils today. I was more focused on the vol stuff, but um, real, real bizarre, funky uh, what was going on. And this, this customer just bought the time. I mean, they could be wrong. They gave themselves plenty of time, but. Um, just yucky mark half a buck right in the first day is not very good um, doesn't doesn't feel good to be that wrong that fast you know there's was some interesting stuff i was didn't get a chance to really bring it up in the, in the trading block but there is a bit of a disconnect these days between some of the uh some of the producers on the oil side and what's been going on on the commodity side of the fence commodity obviously taken on the chin rallied a bit of late but still down uh, over the last year or so uh, versus what's been going on in the producers, particularly the, sh- the shale side. A lot of people thought those guys would see uh, a market decrease in their in their stock price, and they'd be attractive takeover targets. And so far, at least, we haven't seen a lot of that. Their their stock's still somewhat inflated compared to the commodity prices, at least. And so there's been some interesting disconnect. Perhaps our friend here, uh, thinking out in that in that realm, that uh, our fr- our name here is due. For a bit of a pop, a bit of a bit of a correction. That they're not only are they are they do they merit that premium? They merit a quite a bit more here. Either way, this is a, this is an aggressive trade. However, you want to clip it, and our friend here, unfortunately, having some bad timing. So there you go, listeners. Not you're not the only one who sometime has has bought the top and sold the bottom. People with much larger pockets, much deeper pockets than you, have also known that pain. As we move on into our final name, also focused. In the petroleum side of the fence, another frequent offender here on the old odd block, making its presence felt again. This is OIH. This is the Market Vectors Oil Services ETF, closing today $33.30, up about 1% on the day. This is the name that actually does about 18,000 contracts a day. Having a light day, actually, today, which is a little bit surprising, only doing 10,000 contracts today. But it's not always just a volume explosion that catches our eye. It is something amidst the volume that uh, is intriguing, bizarre, sometimes just weird. And what caught our eye out here today uh, was someone going for perhaps a wee bit of yield out here in uh, OIH, in particular, a little bit closer to home. These are the AUG 35 calls. Let me put this up. Uh, this morning, it was saw about 5,000 of these going up. It's like about a total only of 5,000 on the day. So that was pretty much the lion's share of the volume there. Going up in one block on the Philly, paper selling uh, for 55 cents. Uh, so there was some stock with it as well. About 160,000 shares are almost going up uh, for 33 and a quarter. Uh, so essentially, but of course, adding a little bit of extra wrinkle to this, there is some size open interest on the strike. In fact, this is the the size strike out there in AUG to the tune of 25,000 sh- contracts. I almost said shares, contracts over there on this strike. So, Mr. Rock Lobster, where do you fall on this one? Are you falling more towards the closing side, or is it someone you think jumping in for a little bit of income over the next month or so? I, You know, I was – I literally, when I posted this, I was – 50-50 because, 50. Uh, you know, the OIH has had that, a lot of movement lately. Maybe they're trying to take some money off, you know, or take their back spread off a little bit. Uh, but when it comes down to it, it looks like oil's not doing anything. So it looked like just an overwrite to me. They're just – they're not seeing a big gain in oil. Um, and somebody that wants to own the stock and they're just going to sell a bunch of calls against it, and, you know, manage it how they need to depending uh, on how it works. 
Yeah, you know, it, it seems that way. I, I was kind of like you. I was leaning. I was leaning closing because it just. It just usually when it quacks like a duck, it's a duck, and when there's so much so much size on that one strike and an apparently large trade goes up on that strike. It tends to be closing, uh, but it does have a bit of the hallmarks of, uh, of one of these little yield trades. Of course, we'll know for sure tomorrow when the OI numbers are adjusted. Unfortunately, listeners, we're still in that range. And a lot of you are asking, why can't we have uh, intraday open interest? That's a hot topic of conversation. We're not there yet. Maybe in the near future, we will be. Meanwhile, it's time for us. Speaking of the future, it's time for us to keep on rolling right on into our next segment. It's time for some education. It's time for the strategy block. It's time to dispense options, wit, wisdom, and education. It's time for The Strategy Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Strategy Block. This is indeed the portion of the program where we break down, or I should say Uncle Mike really breaks down, some option strategy for you, Don's. His smoking jacket grabs those stone tablets and the bubble pipe from his wall and proceeds to sit by an open window, because we know it is always temperate and pleasant there in St. Charles, to dispense some options, wit, and or wisdom, and sometimes, indeed, hilarity. Uncle Mike, what do you have in store for us today, sir? A couple things, actually. First off, um, Mark, have you seen the, did you see the Minion movie over the weekend? I have not, so my Minions are woefully out of date. They're still purple from the last movie. Got it. So I'll save my minion review for another day. Um, So I won't spoil it for you, but I guess I would have spoiled it for everybody else. But nonetheless, uh, perhaps another day we can discuss the the minion movie. Uh, In terms of today, a couple things that I want to go over. I want to discuss synthetics kind of from a theoretical standpoint. And I also want to give a little bit of an update as to some of the moves with which I've done with my portfolio or with, with my holdings over the weekend. Uh, Well, I guess I didn't do anything over the weekend, but what I did today to adjust from what happened over the weekend. Uh, As everyone knows, that hasn't been under a rock for the last couple days. It looks like they have reached a deal in Greece. Uh, However, uh, as Andrew mentioned earlier, uh, they still their their version of our Congress has not voted to agree on that as of yet. It looks like they will. So it looks like uh, everything is awesome again, so to speak, to quote the Lego movie. Uh, however, it's not a, it's, it's still not a done deal yet. And I think it would be very funny if they actually voted against it. Uh, that would be kind of a funny thing and it wouldn't, I guess it wouldn't be funny, but it would just be very ironic and that it would just show the stubbornness as to how things have been going over there. But I digress. What I did over the weekend is I just went into the weekend with a short put spread. I was short the July 202-198 put spread. And then with the big gap up this weekend uh, in the morning, I closed it out for just a few pennies. And so with that, I've been out of my long call for my SPY long call strategy. And the reason for that is that we did go negative on the year last week. And I got out basically just based on my trading rules. Uh, I still kept on some, some deltas on the table with the short put spreads uh, for the reasons which we mentioned last week. Uh, reason number one is that it's far enough out of the money to where you can sell a put spread and still collect some decent premium for it uh, with volatility being higher. And number two, got to have some deltas on the table. Uh, very seldom will I be long delta free, so to speak. It's not being flat something that uh, it just I can't do it. I got to be bullish, of course. And I literally have to based on what I've promised my clients for the objectives of the Uh, trading strategies. So going into today, after I closed out the put spread for a profit, I could have, based on the put spreads with which I sold throughout the weekend over the course of the last uh, week or so, I could have gotten back into the long call at maybe a few pennies less than what I got out of it based on the fact that I sold those put spreads and I've been making profits on the put spreads in the meantime. Uh, And the reason why is because of the fact that, yes, the market has moved, S&P has moved 50, 60 points, something along those lines, uh, since I started getting out of the put spreads or since I got out of the call. However, volatility has come down quite a bit, uh, just as Mark and Andrew have been talking about. So because of that, the same September 209 call on SPY, uh, even though I got out of it in the uh, threes, it's at 520 right now, but with the premium with which I've been selling over the course of the last week and a half, 
it wouldn't be that much of a loss to get back into it now, even though I've missed out on a lot of the upside of this market. So with that in mind, getting out of long premium, out of a long call when the market comes down, isn't necessarily the worst thing in the world, just because of the fact that when you do that, if the market comes back, you're going to have a drop in implied volatility a lot of times, and it's not going to bite that badly getting back into it. Now, I've taken the stance that based on today's market movement, I just decided to simply sell a 207-203 front week put spread, a little bit closer than what I like to do. Uh, and with vol dropping, it's not my preferred time to sell it. However, I feel that the odds of making money are greater selling a put spread for this week than buying a call. Uh, who knows? The market could get some legs. We could go up to 300 tomorrow on SPY. You never know. But uh, I see this rally starting to slow down a little bit. I, could, I do see it continuing. So for now, based on where I am at with my trading at this stage and that strategy, uh, I'm simply going to be selling put spreads and trailing the market as a precautionary stance. Uh, we still have a lot of things that could happen based upon China. Now, of course, we have the um, put a gun to their head if they sell the stock short. Uh, we still have Iran. It's still not 100 percent a done deal yet. And something could still happen with Greece. You never know. So I'm still playing it safe for the time being uh, with what we have going on. Now, with our hedged stock strategies or with our hedged SBY or hedged strategic night, uh, we're still in the underlyings there. We didn't miss a beat there. We've just been selling put spreads, trying to finance the long puts. So with that, we've remained in those uh, positions as per usual. Just the long calls we got out of for the time being, and we'll probably get back in uh, if this rally does continue and we get a little bit more, uh, and probably after another couple of weeks. But in the meantime, uh, what we're looking to do is just sell put spreads. Now, moving onward, I want to cover synthetics. And I just want to discuss this briefly. Uh, because of the fact I think it's something that's important with which you need to know that uh, we need to talk about uh, if you're an option trader. Uh, let's say that you own XYZ stock at 50 and you simultaneously buy the 50 put. Now, what that does is your risk is significantly less. No longer do you have any stock price or stock risk. You now have premium risk on that long put. So with that being said, your maintenance requirement in a Reg T margin account would be the same as the stock. You don't get any margin or maintenance relief from it. Uh, and you could also buy a long call, and it would be about the same price as what the long put would be. So from the standpoint of leverage, if you're in a Reg T margin account, you're obviously better off if you're trying to get as much leverage as you can buying one call versus buying 100 shares of stock plus one long put. Now, how does this affect you as a trader? Well, it affects you in that you need to have an understanding as to what you're doing. Now, that's an oversimplified example as to what I just said. What I do want to address is the difference between a long spread, vertical spread and a short vertical spread. They're the same thing. If you were to buy the 50-55 call spread, it would be the same thing, synthetically speaking, as selling the 50-55 put spread. One thing that Mark Sebastian often says on this show, or he has said a lot in the past, is that there's no such thing as a credit spread and that he hates that term. Now, naturally, what, I, what it is my duty to do as an educator is say the word credit spread as oftentimes as possible just for the sole purpose of annoying Mark. However, Mark does make a good point. Whenever you hear someone say something along the lines of, I like trading credit spreads because money just goes into your account instantly. Well, yeah, it does, but you need to have an understanding of the full story. When you sell a credit spread, yes, you are technically getting a credit for it. However, your obligation is the, dis the difference between those two strike prices with which you sold. And ultimately, if buying a debit spread works out to be a better trade than selling a credit spread, folks, buy the debit spread. It's all different based upon – it's all different based upon – where you could get the best fill, what works best with your plan of attack in terms of adjusting the trade, whatever the case may be. But my point is, don't be afraid of doing something with a debit just because it says the word debit. Uh, I've heard, pe I've literally heard people say at conventions before uh, or at uh, trade shows before, uh, yeah, I, I don't do debit spreads. I just like to do credit spreads because I get paid for them. Debit spreads, I pay them. Credit spreads, they pay me. 
anyone who says that is, well, quite frankly, a pinhead. And you need to just walk out of that presentation immediately if you ever do hear anybody saying such a thing. Uh, what I want to mention is that if you do have the ability to differentiate between the call spread and the put spread, go with whichever one makes more sense to you. Number one, you might be able to get a nickel fill or better uh, on one or the other. But number two, what works best with how you plan to adjust if you're right or if you're wrong? Now, once you get a little bit more advanced and let's say you have a portfolio margin account, the same thing can hold true for deciding whether or not to buy a call option or whether or not to be long stock, long put. On portfolio margin, you will get a lot more maintenance relief for having a long put against a stock. Now, I'm not going to get into everything that portfolio margin is right now, but at some stage when you're at that level, it's something with which to definitely consider. So on that note, that concludes an update as to what I'm doing with my trades as a quick little lesson on synthetics. Back to you, Mark. Thank you for that, sir. And while you were talking, uh, I was thinking, uh, you know, you used to be our go-to diehard Apple devotee. That's kind of in the rear view mirror for you. And you like to talk about put spreads on SPY a lot, and certainly that, that's a good thing to talk about. But that can't be your go-to thing here on the show. It's just, it's just too general. So I'm trying to think of what, what, your new, uh, what your new name, your new specialty, your new diehard love should be. Is it going to be XLE? Is there something else that's kind of catching your eye? Or are you still kind of waiting to find your new love? You know, SPY is always going to be the basis of everything with which I do because of the fact that I'm such the diehard bull with which I am. Uh, but lately, probably the new go-to thing, so to speak, has been the ratio spreads on TLT. Uh, so I would say, uh, I guess maybe Alex corrupted me somewhat, but I have a new love for uh, trading TLT and uh, with a slightly downward bias. I was going to say that sounds like Alex speaking through your mouth, sir. But we'll leave that where it lay as we move on. We got a little bit of time here, so I think maybe we could squeeze in one question. So we'll dive in for a really quick mail block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for the mail block. All right, everybody, welcome to the Mail Block. This is the portion of the show where you guys get your turn on the old all-star panel. Hit us up a variety of ways. Surf on over to the website. Probably the easiest way, theoptionsdecider.com. Leave us a contact question on the contact form. Post a comment in the show notes anywhere you like, and we'll get a hold of it. Bring it on the show. We read them all, even if you don't answer them all. Or you can hit us up by email, questions at theoptionsinsider.com, twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or just check out the mobile app. It's all there, at least in the iOS version, working on getting it for the other versions as well. All right, going to kick things off with a nice general, uh, general subjective question here uh, from Fred. He, he writes in quite a bit. He writes, hey, I heard options traders like to have multiple positions in their trading accounts. How many should I have? A great question. Uh, surprised no one's ever written in with that one before, uh, but it gets back to a lot of the things we've hit on on this show many times. Risk management, uh, your expertise in the marketplace, your portfolio margin versus reg T type account, the size of your account. There's a lot of things uh, that play into that equation, and I'd imagine you ask five option traders, they're going to have five different answers uh, to that question. Uh, but that said, I'll, I'll kick things off, and when I ever get something like this from a, a user, I usually tend to grade it uh, by not just their account size. People can have a lot of money, but very little options expertise. So I really tend to grade it more along the lines of their options expertise. If they're very much, very, very neophytes when it comes to options, uh, if they're options novices, then I, I think keep it simple, stupid. The smaller, the better. Maybe just one position uh, to start so they can get a handle on that. Maybe it's something simple, buying a call. Maybe it's something simple like a covered call, something along those lines. Uh, typically, it's usually buying a call. That seems to be what 85% of most options traders do to start their options trading career. I think it's just a psychological thing. It's hard to buy a put for whatever reason, but buying a call, they can wrap their heads around. Uh, so yes, yeah, one is certainly more than enough to manage and handle and get a handle on that and see how that performs and see if it works out the way you think. Then you slowly as your options expertise evolves, uh, you could add more positions. You can leg into verticals. You can have multiple calls. You can have multiple verticals, multiple different positions. You know, by multiple, I mean two or three, not a ton. Don't get, don't get way ahead of yourself. Uh, until you start feeling 
like you have a handle on how these things perform in the real world. And of course, also whether your account size can handle it. And we talked before too about don't go all the way down on the flip side. Don't go all the way down uh, to zero margin, you know, zero maintenance margin. They always say like, you know, if you use a hundred percent of your account, sometimes uh, not the, usually not the best thing. You want to have a little bit of a cushion in there for adjustments for different things you need to take on and off. Uh, and so uh, if you use up all of your account, not a good thing either. You want to have some sort of nice middle ground, but I tend to generally grade it from, uh, the level of experience and the more experienced you are, obviously, the more you can manage multiple positions and get into things like Mike was just saying about having, you know, let's say spy positions and doing ratio put spreads against it. And you can handle that without really overwhelming yourself. But uh, I tend to just go in that order of the more experienced you are, the more positions you can generally handle in your account. But I don't have a rule of thumb, five. <laughs> yes, I don't have anything like that. It really tends to go on their experience. Uh, Uncle Mike, you'll give you a bit of a rest here. I'll have Andrew start first. Mr. Rock Lobster, I'd imagine you get variation on this question quite a bit over there in the pits. Uh, what's, your, what's your general answer to people on this topic? Well, uh, I, can just, I can break it down by saying, first, we like to keep a, I like to keep a cushion of about half your – like you'd say you have a trading account, right? You're going to trade options. Okay, let's say it's a hundred thousand bucks, right? Just take half of the money and forget about it. So keep half in cash, and then with what you got left, I don't want the risk in any one position to eat up more than two and a half percent of my total dollars in the account. So that would start helping you size how big the position is, because when you're tr thinking about how to kind of trade options, you don't want one position to blow up so bad that you're only one trade away from making the money back. So you want to keep things in perspective. You know, that keeps you from like, okay, well, I'm going to keep doubling down on this and selling this and eventually it'll work. Well, <laughs> what also could happen eventually is all your money's gone. So Are you saying that doesn't work? Wait a minute. I, I need to go. I need to, <laughs> exactly. I need to make some, I need to cancel some trades. Excuse me. You might, wanna, <laughs> you might want to move those stop orders closer to the market. Um, and, so you so you get an idea of relative size. Me, as soon as I have more than ten positions, uh, there has to be a pretty good reason. Uh, at this point, although when I was a market maker, I had 190 or 100, maybe 175. I think was the most I ever had. So it depends on um, you know what you're doing, what you're trading. I think for most people, two or three positions where you have some relative. Uh, balance will probably be more than enough. Uh, most of the pro traders that we have, uh, some of them range from a hundred positions down to like one or two or three where they really focus on a certain product, understanding how it works under, you know, and they kind of, you know, they're focusing on that as, as a trade and they don't get too caught up in all kinds of different things. So, I would say, yeah, as a rule of thumb, like, you know, we try to manage our little strategy letter at Option Pit. I don't like having more than 10 positions in the whole thing. So it, it becomes a little, that forces me to start wanting to close because I, I, usually when that happens, you get so much on one side of the market, meaning, you know, I'm selling too many options or I'm buying too many options. You have to start thinking about, you know, how much risk you're putting on to add that extra one. So hopefully that is some helpful guidelines. Yeah, I think, I think 10 is a, definitely a decent number. Hundreds, I mean, some of your pro traders, that, that's quite a bit. I mean, obviously, when I was a market maker, I had positions went well into the hundreds as well, but a little bit of a different beast there. You know, those aren't all prop positions. Those are all hedged, and you can kind of adjust them in the aggregate and kind of hedge them in the aggregate. And so it wasn't really like I was managing, you know, 100 some odd individual positions at once. You know, it's more right. you could manage it. And it was mostly in one underlying, so that, or maybe a handful of underlying. So it was pretty, pretty focused for the most part. If there was hundreds of positions across multiple underlyings, that's quite a bit. <laughs> that's, yeah, I had 150, 150 underlyings. 100, 170. Yeah, that that that's of course the way it is these days. Of course, when you have to you have to stream across multiple pits, uh, and that's just uh, kind of the nature of the beast. But again, market maker a little bit different than what we're talking about here. But still, yeah, I think I think in that five to ten range is uh, is a good rule of thumb or a good guideline at least for a lot of people who are looking for answers to this kind of question. Because you start getting beyond that, uh, you could certainly uh, certainly shut yourself a little bit too thin from an account and also just a time management. You have to have time to manage these things as well as well as expertise. You can kind of dig yourself a hole. So somewhere in that range. 
uh, certainly uh, certainly a good one. Don't feel compelled to see these people out there just trading and adjusting nonstop all day. If that's not your style, that's fine. Uh, you don't need to have you know 50 different positions uh, to be an active professional trader. You can have a handful and just watch those and adjust those, and that could certainly work out very well uh, for you. So uh, without further ado, that's all the time we have uh, for the mail block. And now we'll keep on rolling. Of course, send more questions in because we'll, we'll get to more of them on Thursday. And now it's time for us to keep on rolling into our final segment. It's time for Around the Block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, well, we talked a lot about tasty euros, and hopefully that is indeed in the rear view mirror, which means it's time to to bring our gaze a little bit closer to home, back to the domestic arena where the lion's share of the activity is the kickoff of the old earnings season. It started officially, of course, last week, but on the names you guys are really into are starting to kick off this week. We got tomorrow starting with Tuesday. Uh, we got J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo and, of course, Yum Brands, everyone's favorite. Uh, Wednesday, a lot of the tech names you guys like, including the old Widowmaker, the Netflix, and Intel, my old stomping grounds, Bank of America, and uh, a few other names out there, BlackRock, etc. Thursday, out to City, and then, of course, the Googs, the big one there, the Googs, and then eBay, uh, Blackstone, Goldman Sachs, AMD, and Friday, wrapping it up with GE and Honeywell. Uh, so there are quite a few names out there that are active from an options perspective uh, for you guys to sink your teeth into. Of course, if you're not if you haven't had your fill of Fed talk, Fed speak, uh, we've also got Yellen uh, testifying uh, before uh, the House and Senate committees on Wednesday and Thursday. So uh, we think we kind of she's already kind of let the cat out of the bag. We kind of know what to expect from her at this point. But who knows if you're a diehard Fed watcher, Fed announcement imminent, <laughs> that's you, uh, then perhaps this will intrigue you as well. In addition to that, Mr. Rock Lobster, what's catching your eye? I'd imagine you're still watching that impending and ongoing volatility apocalypse out there if it will continue in further sessions. Um, I think uh, we know by Wednesday the Greek legislature votes. I mean, the market is pretty much pricing it like you guys don't have a choice. Um, and it seems it's almost like the EU this time is taking some of the management out of the Greeks' hands, like. Basically, there's, what, $50 billion they want to escrow in uh, Greek asset sales, uh, which is – this is like the, f the funny thing with Greece is the, the, sh the shipping companies pay like pay no taxes, and um, they've got you know billions and billions of dollars of state-owned assets, and they own $250 billion in, you know, to the EU. It's like – so it's like there's money there. There's assets there. It's just they don't, they don't want to do anything. So anyway – so I guess it looks like it's possible if they want to make some things happen, start paying some of this debt down. And if they do, um, things will look pretty good. So I that's – I mean I, I think the China thing is kind of at least contained or corralled I, for a, a short amount of time. But that's basically watching the ball come in and you know, really I just don't see what gives the market a lot more legs. We didn't, we didn't sell off a lot on the Greece thing and I just – you know. I can see us going back to all-time highs, but what we need something to propel us above that. That's all. Well said, sir, and that's going to do it for the Around the Block segment. It's also going to do it for this episode of the Option Block. But before we go, as always, let me check in with each of my cohorts here on the old ASP, see what they have cooking. Uncle Mike had to run, but of course, if you want to learn more about what they're cooking up, surf on over to RCM Wealth Advisors. Kick the tires over there. Check out that strategic night portfolio he was talking about, as well as all the other cool things they have going on over there at RCM. And of course, hit up Uncle Mike personally if you'd like to discuss things like ratio put spreads and spy or perhaps you're still an apple devotee and you want him to help you get in there or manage those positions or any other name you guys have and you want some options expertise on uncle mike is indeed the guy to call and before we wrap up mr rock lobster what's cooking in the land oh the pit uh we have a calendar webinar on saturday it costs money uh it costs, uh, you know, 20 cents on a 10 lot. Uh, but uh, if you want to understand how calendars work or why you've been trading them and you never make any money, uh, this would be a good way to learn actually how they work and when the best time actually to put them on is. Uh, and I will give you a hint. 
the current market condition is not great for calendars with the vol coming up this week. So um, unless a miracle happens, they ain't going to work too well. So, but that's about it. And that will be this Saturday. Surf on over to optionpit.com uh, forward slash events and get yourself on the list. You got to say, you're really selling me there. You come off saying you got a webinar starting to cost money. <laughs> and then it's not going to work too well. <laughs> you're selling me, but I'm going to go anyway because it sounds fun. Uh, <laughs> of course. Yeah, we, we've, uh, those webinars have been, those, sat those uh, we do them once a month. They've been really, really popular. So I'm surprised. So what the heck? There you go. In, in spite of your best efforts, they are yes, indeed possible. Yes, in spite of our best efforts. People keep coming back. In spite of your best efforts to warn people away from your webinars. People and if still you're an Option up. Pit Gold member, you get all the webinars for free. Oh, well, there Pretty you go. Deal. There you go. A new, uh, a new wrinkle to uh, the gold thing. So check that out, listeners, if you haven't done so already. On behalf of the Rock Lobster and Uncle Mike and, indeed, myself, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading and streaming and subscribing to the show. And, of course... For sending in such great questions, keep them coming, and we'll see you next time right here on the Option Block. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. 